Hello, how are you? I'm uh, Morgan Guy and I'm from the Nola Wesley Foundation and just wanted to let you know that we're having another open mic. Um, it's gonna be this Thursday at seven o'clock. We are at 7102 Frerit Street, which is right next to the Palms, very close to the corner with Broadway. And uh, we just wanna invite any musicians or poets or people who wanna listen to local music uh, to come on out. I am gonna be standing outside with some flyers for it. Um, you can email me to get on our list. Um, my email address is mguyton, M-G-U-Y-T-O-N, at tulane.edu. So, um, but I'll, like I said, I'll be outside afterwards with flyers. Thanks. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to thank everyone who came to my record release show this weekend. I released my EP last Wednesday. It's called Down, Down, Deep, and it premiered on Indie Current. Um, if you guys check it out, please tell me what you think. Thank you so much. Hello. My name's Aiden. I'm one of the vocalists of a band called The Hashcats. We recently got together, and we have a demo on SoundCloud. We got a Facebook and a website. So just go look up The Hashcats. And the demo is called THC. All right, thank you all. Have a good day. What's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? You know, I got to shake the hand of the man. Um, I just want to say I love y'all. You know, I haven't told y'all in a while. Uh, I've been missing. Um, I, I cut my beard, if you didn't notice. Uh, yes. Uh, my mom, I work at Whole Foods. That's what he was alluding to. Y'all should come see me at Whole Foods. Um, yeah. So basically, I'm just here to say how much I love y'all and how much I really want to impart my love onto y'all so you can love yourselves as much as I love myself because the key to happiness is loving yourself. And in order to love yourself, you must, you know, eat right, live right, and most importantly, treat each other as if you would treat yourself. So, um, you know, all that to say that uh, my name's Evan Thibodeau, and I have a record label called Living Soul Development. If you're interested, come talk to me, man. Peace. Yo, real quick, uh, my friend Zane Roche has a song coming out today, and uh, it's called I'm Addicted. You should get it. Um, it's really cool. Unlike most.com, Zane Roche, look him up. You can get it. And also, um, Zane Roche, Austin Moore and the Chopped Up Tulips, and Jay Seuss and an, um, Nonsense Sound are having a show at Dragon's Den tomorrow. It's free. Um, come at 9.30. It, uh, that's when the doors open, so it's going to be dope. What he said also... Um the Tulips put together a 12-man uh, distribution team to get put out these flyers. Found this one on the ground. Um, and unfortunately, I can't print bigger ones for free in the library. So you will probably see one of the 12 of us around town, school, whatever, later on today. So make sure you pick one of these up and make sure you don't miss the show tomorrow at the Dragon's Den. It's free. Any more announcements? Okay. Um, so today's guest is a senior at Worcester College in Boston, Massachusetts. The Polytechnic Institute. Sorry, uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and he's also a friend of mine uh, back in my hometown. Um, over the past couple of years, he's had the opportunity to be heavily involved in the music industry as well as go to school um, now as part time. Uh, he's worked his way up from uh, working with Time Flies, uh, Bruce Springsteen, and ha is currently working for the live sound of Porter Robinson. On top of that, he also does software development. Uh, so please give Racy Stepanovich a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll, we'll talk a little more about your resume, but um, what, right. what got you into, into sound engineering to begin with? Um, well, I guess 
sort of I really got heavily involved with my high school's percussion program. I was really fortunate to be at a, a high school that had a very well developed. So I grew up being a classically trained percussionist for 12 years. Yeah. Um, and that sort of sparked my interest into doing different arrangements or things. So I started doing arrangements for our uh, marimba ensemble and so on. And then tending towards junior and senior year, like probably some of you, I somewhat wanted to impress a girl. <laughs> and so I started doing some recording and production work, um, pretty much starting with other workstations like FL Studio and working to Ableton. And since then, that's always been a hobby. Um, and then pursuing that on the side. Uh, but even then, I don't necessarily think I really got into any sort of recording or live sound engineering per se until I got involved uh, and at my university, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, so, and so it took WPI to get you sort of involved in the actual technical study of live engineering. Yeah, um, I originally attended there to pursue electrical engineering, which for me is a hobby and I've sort of always wanted to pursue doing engineering for the hardware for the hardware engineering field, like potentially maybe engineering the next great SSL desk or something for people who can appreciate that. But what also was fortunate about the school, um, like this university has a really great recording arts program and a good facility. My university had a really good live sort of facility and a club that sort of fostered that. So throughout freshman year and onwards, I got really involved with this club that handled all the live sound events on campus. Mm -hmm. And because it was completely volunteer, the people there really sort of fostered an interest. And a lot of my mentors were just seniors who had a lot of technical knowledge who then sort of passed it on and it, it grew from there. Right, right. And so, and so gradually, your focus sort of gravitated toward live sound exclusively. Or do yeah. you still do studio recording? Um, not so much studio work. I, I, I do love doing it a lot. Um, do you think you'll find your way back to studio work? I, I'd like to. Uh, for me, there's a bit of wanderlust in mm -hmm. at least the live road right now that mm -hmm. sort of drawing me to it. Um, I'm also not very well versed in Pro Tools or any of that studio world. I, I cannot track anything for the life of me. Right, right. Um, but I definitely would like to see it someday, especially if maybe things don't pan out or something, I would mm -hmm. love to sort of maybe stay local in an area and you know, work in a local studio. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Um, wh you know, what did you do you know, to get involved in touring to begin with? I mean, obviously, a lot of the people sitting in this room, that's the way they, that's the way they sort of um, uh, find their way into, into, in, into these conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, like, what's in it for me? You know, how, yeah. how could somebody in my position do what this guy did? Um, and so what, what led you into uh, you know, the, the, a situation where you were actually gaining live sound gigs? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I definitely think that, um, I guess first I should say that my uncle is a product, was the production manager for uh, Bruce Springsteen for the last few years. And so my entry point into the touring industry was him offering me a job over the summer to go out and work with him, which admittedly was just slinging barricade around and sort of doing odds and ends here or there. But that definitely gave me a couple different connections and things that would later let me pursue. And it really also served to spark interest to pursue live sound further. I was going to say, it gave you an opportunity to yeah. actually watch it be done. Yeah. I mean, because that's stuff that nobody really gets to see in the setup phase, right? Exactly. Most people, unless they, unless they are supposed to be on the premises, they would never see it. And the amount of work that goes into those setups is almost absurd. Yeah. The, the technology that's there and the amount of cooperation yep. and synergy that needs to be implemented to have this happen in such a small time frame really, really sort of struck a chord with me. Yeah. And I, me being admittedly the nerd that's going to a school that has the mascot of a goat, <laughs> um, I, I, I sort of just sunk my teeth into it and really got motivated. Um, then that after sort of the summer job sort of carried itself into the preceding school years. 
and just sort of sparked live. And I really only got, I think, a big break of something like a job that I would say that I, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of earned on my own uh -huh. or without you know a family sort of tie-in. Mm -hmm. Actually started with a small band called Time Flies. Um, they did a show at my university, I believe, three years ago, and the club that we, you know, that I was in, ended up doing a lot of the production. Right. Unfortunately, the band had an issue where they didn't were, weren't able to provide a modern engineer. So I, thankfully, was able to sort of step up to the plate and try it out. Yeah. Um, a couple days later, I get approached by their production manager and front of house engineer. His, his name is Robert Dugan. And he approached me saying they liked my work and asked if I could help out with some other things. And so over the course of that year or so, yeah. I would do a couple freelance gigs with them. And right. they weren't even paid. I would right. Right. you know, just go to New York for a day, drive down the three-hour trip, and do a show at Terminal 5 with them, and then yeah. <laughs> go back at 4 in the morning the next day just, just to hang out with the guys because yeah. they were yeah. really fun. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, and that's, that's sort of an important point is that, you know, you, you know, you had certain advantages that gave you the opportunity to sort of train your focus on what you wanted to do, but, um, <clears throat> but you worked for nothing anyway after that, yeah. you know, and which is kind of what, these, what, what everybody does anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, back up for a second. Tell me where you went on tour, your summer tour with Springsteen. Where'd you go? Uh, wow. Uh, because, the... because it kind of, it, 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 you, you referred to the wanderlust, right? So, yeah. So what, where did um, you tour? Those were the years where <clears throat> Bruce did the European tours over the summer. So as a person who hadn't traveled out of the contiguous United States all his life, mm -hmm. being able to go to most of Europe, you yeah. know, Spain, Germany, France, the yeah. UK. With, for a reason. For a reason. Yeah. Effectively getting paid to, to yeah. travel yeah. is yeah. just incredible. And, you know, there were, there were times in the schedule where we would have several shows in a week back to back and yeah. just bus overnight straight through and just see the inside of <laughs> arenas or, or stadiums and not really get an appreciation. But mm -hmm. there were other times where we, for example, had five days off in, uh, in Naples, Italy, yeah. where you know we just had an awesome time. All, all, all the crew was there. Yeah. And because you're living and working with them for three or four months out of the year, mm -hmm. they're, they're really just your family. And yeah. you know, going on different escapades or... Well, and, and what's interesting about the road that, that I think, I think is, is, that, is that sense of a group high, you know, that idea that you're all cooperating, you all have really critical jobs to do, everybody's working hard, and then when you're off or you're, or you're on downtime, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real, it's a, it's a bonding experience, but, but it does something to you, right? I mean, that's what, that's what sort of made you decide you wanted to be a live engineer was that sort of the lifestyle aspect. De of definitely. It. The lifestyle really did, uh, definitely had a nice appeal to me. And I think a lot of that was the bond of camaraderie that formed. Yeah. You know, whenever you're working a show, things can be very cutthroat. People can say things. But at the end of the day, as soon as, as, soon as it's said and done, those people will do anything in the world to support you. And I would do the same likewise. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you, you, you toured over the summer. You know, did, did that touring have any other influence on you? Any other, any other affect on your, on, your, on your direction or your, or your thinking? I definitely got really involved with audio, mostly because I, I shadowed more of the audio people. Right. And you kind of got thrown into a, a very active situation, right? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, so whenever I was done setting up the barricade, uh, which are just the crowd barriers for the show, I would usually just walk around and you know nerd out at different things. Or I would always be bugging our modern engineer, Troy Milner, or our front of house guy, um, sort of you know how things work or why things were set up and mm -hmm. et cetera. Yeah, and, and at some point, you also have to realize that you got to sort of grow up, right? You got to be really fairly self-sufficient and mature to be on the road. There's very little tolerance for error or for right. mistakes. And if you make them, you, you have to own up to it, definitely. Yeah. You know, you're, no one's responsible for making sure you get to the bus on time or worse, the, the shuttle to the airport on time. Yeah. You know, we, there were some people who I won't name who slept in and missed a flight to, you know, an eight hour flight. Um, there's definitely a significant amount of individual responsibility and accountability for not only just things outside of tour, but also doing your job and making sure that you're doing it in a way that 
positively assists other people and isn't interfering with what they have to do as well. So it kind of requires a balance between maturity and the urge to have fun, right? Yeah. You, know, you can have fun and, keep, and, and stay on top of your game. Exactly. And I think, I think if you're in either end of that spectrum of too fun-loving or that you take your job too seriously, that your job becomes too, too miserable. You need to know when you can relax or, you know, have funny moments during a break. And that's, that's where, honestly, most of my, the memories that were, were formed for yeah. me are, is when you, we have a couple hours downtime and then we end up playing wiffle ball on the stage right, or, or right. something just yeah. completely absurd. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. And so, and so um, how did you get involved? You, you, so you went from Springsteen to Time Flies, right? Yeah. And then how did you get involved with Porter Robinson? What's the story there? Um, so I ended up interestingly enough, started doing software design for Time Flies, where they approached me asking me to design them an iPhone application that would let the audience effectively text um, freestyle topics to their video wall in real time. Uh, the main artist, during every show, they have a, a freestyle song where some, either the local promoter or some mm -hmm. of the audience will write a list of topics that are pertinent and relevant to that area and then they will then freestyle. But because the audience just sees a sheet of paper, right. they were getting a lot of public flack for uh -huh. just being accused of reading something off a page or right. doing it in advance. And so they wanted to approach it differently. Mm -hmm. So I ended up working uh, over the summer to develop an application and mm -hmm. some other things, some hardware and things that basically enable the audiences to really interact with their show. It must be hard to freestyle about the goose problem on the municipal golf course. Yeah. Uh, because, you know. um, those artists are definitely very talented. And yeah. I, don't, I do not envy them for yeah. having to look at a wall behind them and oh, I have to tie these words together. That must be fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but that's actually cool. That's a great, that's a great um, solve to the problem, right? Yeah, the yeah. problem where they, they, they probably could have never seen that problem coming. That mm -hmm. Reading off a page was going to make them seem like they were reading off a page. Exactly. Who would have thought that? <laughs> and then, you know, but then, but then coming up with a creative solution where the audience is participating in the set, that's, that's pretty brilliant. And so how did that, how did that work out? Um, it worked out really, really well. Um, unfortunately, their tour, to my knowledge, didn't do very well. At least in the start, but it definitely picked up. And once the once the public kind of saw they were doing this somewhat avant-garde piece mm -hmm. of technology exposition, it definitely really sort of kicked in, and you could cool. feel that there was a really a bigger sense of engagement compared to other similar acts. So let me let me ask you a question, just because I'm curious. Mm -hmm. So was it moderated content, or did could people? Just, I mean, how often did people just text We've, the word "but"? To the, <laughs> you know, to we, the wall? we we tried it both ways. Yeah. Eventually, we leaned towards the side of moderation. So <laughs> yeah. there was some poor soul sitting at front of house going, "Yes, no, yeah. no, no, yes, oh, what is that?" Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, is that an umlaut? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. Cool. Um, and so, then, I guess to continue the point, yeah, yeah, yeah. they originally asked me to come out for, I guess this would, would have been the past fall semester to work on their new fall tour mm -hmm. um, as a tech for this system and just to help you know, fit in wherever, probably yeah. do monitors or such. But unfortunately, due to budgeting reasons, things fall through all the time, mm -hmm. so it just didn't work out. Um, but thankfully, uh, Robert Jugan and I, their production manager again, had a really good relationship mm -hmm. And he effectively said, hey, I feel really guilty for not doing this. Uh, let me see if I can you know, make some calls and Connect find another somewhere. gig. Yeah. And a little bit later, coincidentally, I get a call from him at 12.30 at night mm -hmm. just saying, hey, how well do you know Ableton? Um, pretty well. I'm yeah. pretty competent in that software. You know, and can you, can you mix uh, front of house too? Yeah, pretty, pretty well. I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert, but mm -hmm. I think I can do it. Do you want to be Porter Robinson's Ableton in front of house guy? Right. And I've admired his work for a long time, right. you know, with his previous album and et cetera. So when, when this call gets to me, I'm thinking, is this, is this real? <laughs> like, yeah. is, this, is this happening? Um, and he's admittedly been a bit notorious for saying, oh, I'm going to set you up with this happening. And then <laughs> yeah, nothing yeah, ever yeah. pans out. Yeah. So you take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. You usually take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and things happen. But... Mm -hmm. Then immediately following, I get an email from their team saying, are you free for a conference call tomorrow with all of our engineers? And I said, sure. And lo and behold, the next day I had a two hour conference call. And when I came out the other side, I was pretty certain I had a job that was also terrified. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. 
And so what was, uh, what was the job ahead of you? I mean, um, how long a commitment? What was, what, what was the tour? You know, what was this? So and, 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 oh, sorry. Oh. And in what way were you dealing with um, Ableton and front of house? Exactly. So um, it was a little shaky. They didn't give me too many details at first off the bat. Um, I was originally intended to go out and work on their fall tour, mm -hmm. um, at least the U.S. legs. And then that fell through, and I only ended up working uh, the English and Australian tours, and then uh, henceforth. Oh, wow. Well, you had to go yeah. to England and Australia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was just interesting because it got to a point where uh, things were lining up, and I was almost certain I was going to go out and work the tour. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, I withdrew from classes. I was only anticipating uh, working or. So what, what year at, at Worcester Polytech were you in? So this, this was my senior year. So, so, okay. I was so you were withdrawing semester. from classes first semester senior yeah. year. Yeah, and, and I was pretty well off on classes that if I overloaded with a couple extra classes yeah. second semester, I probably could have pulled it off well. and graduated on time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't terribly worried about it, though. Okay. So I figured that it would be best to you know, pursue this or so. Yeah. Um, and so I ended up taking a semester off, and this fell through. So there was about a month and a half of time where I was just sitting there going, I have nothing to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Could have been in school, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you had to kill a month and a half, but then what happened? Um, then uh, we ended up you know, going to, I added some studio time with Porter beforehand to kind of just learn the set and learn yep. what he liked and didn't like. And then from there, we ended up flying to London and doing, my first show was at a venue called Coco. Oh, yeah. Which is uh, huge, yeah. It's, it's a beautiful theater. Yep. Great lights. Yeah. Um, and that was very much straight, in, straight in, in, into the fire. It was <laughs> the first time I ever had been working with all of the gear they had mm -hmm. and, you know, had really sort of come into a system that I, I didn't know. Uh, and front of house in Coco is kind of woolly. It's a, it's, a, it's a loud, bouncy room. It's a very, for those who don't know, it's an old converted theater, I believe, yeah. or yeah, at least it is, it's, yeah. it's styled. It's an old like legitimate it. theater, yeah. yeah um, right. And the room definitely has a lot of, of life to it. And so mm -hmm. coming in, it was, it was a bit nightmarish, just sort yeah. of just, you know, you have 15 minutes to get the speakers tuned to sound good with Porter stuff and et cetera, yeah. and kind of yeah. go from there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, it definitely was an interesting uh, experience. You know, Porter and I had to make some last minute changes. It was mm -hmm. sort of a scramble, but. Last minute changes to his set? Uh, just to like some of the way that things were patched in I and see. how the, the wiring was and et cetera. I just see. to make it work for that day. I see, I see. Um, and then, you know, come showtime, it surprisingly was a really decent show. That's and, great. you know, uh, from there, uh, we, you know, we just kept working at it and chipping away at it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I definitely, I've been told by some third parties that their team likes me. And so I, I think yeah. I'm doing something right. Yeah, good. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um, it's, it's great. It's, it's amazing how, how, how difficult things can be on day one of a tour. And seven days later, like just how, how, how systematized you get things to be. Do you, do yeah. you find that that sort of, that sort of curve was, 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 was relevant to you? Well, in, interesting, <laughs> interestingly enough, we had booked a lot of shows throughout Europe, but due to some, some issues with the venues that were chosen for the mm -hmm. tour, we had to cut it down to just two dates. We ended up oh, wow. only doing London and then Amsterdam. Oh, wow. At and, then a, and then a show in Spain. Where, um, where in Amsterdam? Paradiso or Milkveg? Uh, Milkveg. Yeah. yeah, great. Which is also a very interesting place. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that actually show happened to be on Halloween, which oh, wow. led to a bunch of other problems. Yeah. Uh, but so then after those two shows, we went back and we had a couple weeks off. And then right after that, we went right to Stereosonic Australia, oh, which right. is a big traveling festival, yep. um, sort of the equivalent of what a Warped Tour would be, but for electronic music in the United States. Yep, yep. Um, and so there have been a lot of sort of gaps to kind of get up to speed. There was no real big contiguous run of shows where I could that's difficult. That's get familiar real, yeah. or comfortable with it. And yeah, that's a real challenge. And, and have, you, have you yet done a tour that's just a run of dates, a long run of dates? Um, not necessarily. And with, oh, that's a real with, challenge. Our, with our schedule now, it's mostly just sort of fly dates. Yeah, yeah. So we'll usually you know, fly into wherever we're going the day before. Mm -hmm. Me and the other production team Ben is our lighting guy, Ryan's our video guy, and Eric's our production manager. We'll usually go in the day before and just make sure the venue's all set, load in all our gear, yeah. probably do some programming and things. Mm -hmm. 
do the show the next day, load out, fly back the next day, and that's yeah. sort of mostly what it is. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit about your, your experience as being so immersed in the industry while still being in school? I mean, has WPI played well with you on this? Have they cooperated, or does it not matter what they do because you've got your own game plan? I mean, talk, talk about what, what, what that means, first on the school side, and then second on the industry side. Yeah, um, definitely on, on the school side, um, I guess first thing is I was, I was anticipating on going back to full-time classes this semester. Yeah. Um, and right after Stereosonic Australia, their manager, uh, one of their managers, Aaron Green, approached me and asked, hey, you know, we, we, we like your work. If you're free, we'd like you to keep working for us for the rest of, or for all of 2015. Right. right. Um, and so at that point, I had to really sort of make a decision of, well, W what, what do I do? My, my, my whole plan that I worked out for the previous year of having the semester and then finishing up is yeah. now sort of thrown into the mix. And I really had to choose between do I take this opportunity now and work this job? Yeah. Do I try to balance the two? Or do I turn them down and go back to school? And I guess... Wait, wait, wait. What do you think you should do? What do you, uh, like, let's hear it. Like, okay, who thinks you... Applause. Who thinks you should go on tour? <laughs> applause. <laughs> okay, who thinks who thinks you should have stayed in school? <laughs> All right, good. I was just curious what they were pulling for, you know. I didn't. All right, know. Yeah. but go ahead. So, so go ahead. So what do you do? So I mean, I, I guess obviously I leans towards uh, doing part time classes yeah. and juggling what is doing a, a festival sort of circuit, obviously yeah. with with electronic artists and. I think the way that I came about that decision wasn't really figuring out which one was the most benefits, but mm -hmm. figuring out sort of which one I would regret the least. And yeah. I think after a week or so of toiling back and forth, I realized that if I didn't go to school and just, for lack of a better term, dropped out, <clears throat> at least for an indefinite amount of time, I would pretty much be mad at myself for spending the first three years of my life working towards a degree and then just ending it there. But I also not the first not the first three years of your sorry life. the first three years of my college career oh because I was gonna say yeah. I would have oh, heard of pretty you pretty young yeah yeah I would have heard of you if um, you <laughs> got a degree at age three yeah it's pretty WPI smart kid um, yeah. or you know turning these guys down who yeah. at this point I've I had developed a really good relationship with sure. and you know they were starting to slowly become like my second family almost yeah. And that sort of only seemed like the really valid option at the time. Right. And I sort so of, you took the road opportunity. Yeah, did, right. did whatever I did to make it work. Right. Um, which basically involved taking online classes part time. Oh, wow. And how'd you find that? It, it was OK. I just mm -hmm. did some, some different math classes. And mm -hmm. it was, there were some times where it was rough to schedule things in. But mm -hmm. I, thankfully, WPI is a very accommodating environment where I can talk to a professor and say, hey, I'm traveling. Do you mind if you give me an extension or whatnot? And That's so it, it's worked out so far. That's great. That's great. And so now that you've got your thing, like let's say you know, you're on your career path here, right? Yeah. You're touring a lot. You know, you're doing a lot. You're mixing live sound. You know, um, you, you've got you know, a high profile artist you work with, which generally would mean that if you do everything right, you can feed yourself into your next job, you mm -hmm. know, do you find the idea of, of, your, of your education being more or less useful to you? Are you grateful for it or do you think it's, uh, it's sort of superfluous? I definitely don't think it's superfluous right. and I actually honestly would argue here. that it's invaluable um, just <clears throat> because not, completely even disregarding the fact that it sort of fostered to getting me where I am, yeah. at least with the degree I had it developed a lot of technical knowledge for me and other sort of, it helped to foster that interest, um, at least to pursue not only understanding how things work, but mm -hmm. why things work. And mm -hmm. I think that's really been a great tool, at least for how I think and, and with my workflows into improving different things or you know understanding why changes need to be made or et cetera. Right. Right, right. So, um, I mean, not to mention the fact that it gives you kind of a, a, a fundamental knowledge of your field, right? I mean, you, you've, you've got, you, you didn't learn on the job through trial and error. You also have like, a, 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 I mean, you didn't just learn on the job through trial yeah. and error. You also have a fundamental understanding of circuitry. And, yeah, and, and, exactly. And I think, you know, I think, ha I guess half the fun of learning is trial and error, but knowing a good starting point mm -hmm. 
on what direction to go really does help. And I guess I, I sort of really like the older audio engineers back, you know, in the older recording days, mm -hmm. you know, in like the glory days of when SSL consoles were new or et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the engineers of those times, at least to be an engineer in those times, you had to have an understanding of electronic, elect electric components in yeah. these systems. Yeah. A lot of those people were- We spent were, a lot of time welding, right? Yeah, like, I mean, you know. A, a lot of those people were ner like nerds and, you know, R Rupert Neve, for example, mm -hmm. was, you know, so engrossed in the technical side of things, but yeah. produced these beautiful <clears throat> things yep. that people still use today and, and seek. And that always was, it almost was like a romanticized time for me that I kind of yeah. wanted to be a part of in a way of yeah. just yeah. understanding how things so I could contribute in a very meaningful way as well. Right. And, and I, I would imagine, you know, have an understanding of this stuff, like in a way that gives you a full appreciation of it. Yeah. <clears throat> I said welding, but I meant soldering. <laughs> yeah, fair. Forgive me. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you, you found your way in kind of quickly, unexpectedly even, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what do you think would be some, some really useful qualities for, for a person who's hoping to do the kind of stuff that you're doing? And I know we've got a number of those people in this room. Yeah. Some, some you know, fairly, fairly well qualified, you know, very possible outcomes here. Mm -hmm. So, what, what, you know, what do you think you, you need to check yourself for? I think, I mean, not alluding to anything specific that I do, and I guess sort of making it general is, I've, I've really been a fan of, uh, this might be a bit of a tangent, but I've really been a fan of a video company, video game company called Valve. Um, oh, yeah. They make a game called Half-Life. I'm sure some of you have heard of it. Yeah. But interestingly enough, they've published their employee handbook online, and mm -hmm. so I ended up reading it. And I think the best way that they describe what, I aim to do and what I think, what I see the most successful people doing mm -hmm. is they look to hire what are called T-shaped people, mm -hmm. where uh, the, the person they're looking for has a decent amount of knowledge in every area. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a, a jack of all trades, but they also have one distinguished area that they're, they might not be experts on, but mm -hmm. they're very good at it and they're very motivated about it. Passionate, right? Passionate, yeah. yes. Yeah. But the, the interesting thing is, I don't think you can just be passionate about something to necessarily be the best at it. Mm -hmm. And I think that can only get you so far because the, the, at least in the live industry and definitely in the studio in, you know, industry, you're working with a, a lot of other people who have their own thing that they're passionate about mm -hmm. too. But you, you really need to understand how, how your part plays into everything. Mm -hmm. And there are even times when you know, I've, I've had to do some lighting programming because our lighting guy couldn't make it in in time. And mm -hmm. so having that little bit of knowledge to mm -hmm. help contribute where you can and develop an appreciation for how your work fits into the big picture and the amount of work everyone else is doing right. really, really is crucial, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's very interesting. So, um, so, so that idea of, uh, uh, talk a little more about that idea of a T-shaped person. Mm -hmm. what, what, is that, what that means to you. So. And, and be, you know, be as concrete as you can be. You know, definitely. Um, so I think, I think definitely for me, at least, getting a bit more specific, is I, I feel very confident with Ableton. It's the, the piece of software that I sort of grew up with and yeah. really used. And so I really like tinkering with it, et cetera. And so that is definitely in my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I, I will always be motivated to pursue that and you know, keep to trying different things or working with that. But at the same time, looking at, at the other bits of the field, you know, I, I, I did lighting for a couple of years yeah. uh, just a, as a hobby, you know, in addition yep. to doing some sound stuff and, you know, having a little bit of appreciation for, you know, all, all, all those struggles that, that our lighting guy Ben goes through every show yeah. really sort of made me kind of, reform how I approached my work and you know that I really how yeah so talk about that what do you mean you reformed how you do your work what did what kind of impact did it have on you there um at least in the beginning <laughs> I sort of worked on catering towards setting up for example all of our synthesizers and equipment on stage and leaving um 
the, the bits of our equipment that send uh, control signals to the lighting console off mm -hmm. to the side. But eventually, you know, I realized, and you know, to his credit, Ben didn't even approach me about it. I just, you know, ended up just sort of picking it up that mm -hmm. it would have worked better if I set that up first and leave it running so that way uh, Ben and our video guy Ryan could get started just r right away and so they could dig into their job as well. I see, I see, interesting. Well, you know, I think that uh, we're going to probably have people who want to ask you questions. Mm -hmm. Is there, uh, would you mind answering some questions? No, sure, that's fine. Great. Can we, uh, Adam? Can we, yeah. Anybody have any questions for Racy? Sorry. You guys run. Hey. Yeah, we heard you. Yeah. Um, is, has your employers ever had an opinion on whether or not you were or were not in school? Uh, no. Um, they've, you know, fortunately, I won't say fortunately, but they've definitely, you know, they've been, in, at least not the employer, but the people I work with are interested in my personal life. But it really doesn't, you know, m make a difference on, on what you do outside of your job as long as, as, long as you get the job done. Um, you know, they've... I, I've definitely put them first, so I've never necessarily ran into any conflicts. Yeah, I think that's important, is, but, that, is that it hasn't had an impact on them because yeah. you, you, you've set the priority. Yeah, and I think, that, I think that that's sort of important, um, that if you're really committed to a job, that you need to have that sort of be really prominent in your life. And that doesn't necessarily mean you can't enjoy other things, but I've definitely been really committed to helping Porter's work succeed and their team succeed. And I'm really happy with the choice I made to sort of pursue that and not consider it you know, a side thing in, in my life at least. Right. Great, good question. Hey, thanks for coming in today. I actually saw Time Flies two years ago at my high school, so that was, that was pretty cool. So it's nice to have you here and see you guys again. Um, in terms of like what you've done since Springsteen up till now, uh, perform has performing well on each and every job essentially guaranteed you work with someone else, or has have there been limbo periods, or how does that usually go? Uh, I, I I almost would say that almost there's a constant limbo period of you know you're sort of always developing these interpersonal interpersonal relationships with people and you're you're always I wouldn't say looking to impress people but I think that this is an industry where it's really beneficial to always put your best foot forward always be personable always be accommodating regardless of what situation you're in and always really just to you know say the cliche do your best and I think that through that whether or not you're looking for another job, people will, will recognize that and mm -hmm. pick up on that. And those are the people that you know you, you want to surround. They want to surround themselves with, and you want to surround yourself with. And a lot of the people <laughs> that you see are very much doing the same thing. They're they're always you know having side conversations or just you know uh, you know talking with random people and just seeing what you know what their job is or etc. And that those little connections or things that just might start as a casual conversation with, you know, a band you're working with at a venue or so could lead to your next job. Yeah. Yeah. And you never know when your next job is. So no matter what level you're at, right? I mean, you know, you can be, you can be in uh, limbo. Yeah. For sure. Um, I, I, is there another question? Anybody? Anywhere? Nobody has another question. Hmm. Yeah. Back here. Paul Ableton Chain. Uh, you talk about the difference between doing sound, particularly monitors, for, for electronic music instead of like uh, acoustic instrumentation? Uh, definitely. Um, you know, to be to be honest, the the front of house and monitor stuff is pretty pretty simple for electronic. Um, a lot of the work for mixing that you would normally see on a front of house or monitor console is sort of taken out and at least for Porter's work, I prefer to do it with our own gear. And then I honestly just use the monitor console just as a way to, to monitor levels and feed the speakers and our wireless systems on stage. 
And that's just a choice in a workflow. Um, but there are other issues that you have to take into account. A lot of the, the electronic music doesn't have as much dynamic range. It's mastered very loud, or it has a very wide stereo image that might not work for certain PAs or certain venues. And you know, depending on how the speakers are set up or where the audience is, you might need to make a couple changes to, to make it sound better. That's a good question. Anybody else? Okay. You want to yeah. follow up? Sure. So, like, live sound is typically a curve that is typically mono. Like, they don't pan things left and right because then the people on the other side of the stage can't hear the stuff that's available. So, anyway, you were talking about how the stereo field and electronic music is not really mono compatible. So, have, what are some workarounds for that? Um, uh, for starters, I think most, at least mo the majority of systems I've seen have been stereo. Um, and that's a product of just doing different festivals and things. Um, not to say that electronic music doesn't necessarily work in mono, but um, definitely, uh, at least technically speaking, I've done some things to sort of shrink the width of everything to make sure that everyone can hear everything, etc. But it really comes down to the, the, the source material and what, the way that Porter has engineered the set and his content and the way that we've sort of approached it is that most of his content, the majority of it is already mono just for that sake. And a lot of what happens in the live versions of you know EDM music, oh wow, that's where done in EDM, or um, mm -hmm. Porter's work, are significantly different than the album versions, just to sort of combat all those issues. Cool. Good. Yes. So um, it seems like you're kind of like the young guy working with a ton of experience. So how do you um, kind of compensate for being the young guy with like hard work? Like how do you impress people who have been in the game? for so long being that you are so kind of less experienced, I guess. Yeah, I, I'm definitely less experienced. Um, and I think with that, you, you have to be humble and you have to be willing to learn stuff. And I don't think there's a day that goes by where someone hasn't shown me a trick or you know I haven't discovered something because I have really messed something up and have to scramble to fix it. And you know a lot of that is just Owning up to things you do wrong and being progressive about fixing them, and you know, learning from people who have more experience, and that doesn't necessarily mean you can't bring your own things to the table or you know try different things out. Mm -hmm. um, for example, we did a show in Canada where I ended up hanging out two hours with the house front of the house engineer, and we just sort of tried different things on a Digico console to see what made it sound the best. That so we just both threw ideas out and just to experiment. And you know, there's nothing saying that you necessarily have to be very experienced to do your job well, but it definitely helps, and you definitely have to have respect for, for that and for people who have done things that are tried and true. Right. Good. Anybody else? Yes. I definitely think so. Uh, to be honest, I'm still definitely really young. I'm 22 years old. So I think it would be sort of naive of me to just self-proclaim that that's my purpose. And you know, maybe a couple years down the road, things might change. My interests might change. I'm human and I'm fallible. But um, you know, I think right now, it's what I enjoy doing the most. Mm -hmm. And it's what I like to contribute to. And I think that's really what, what resonates with me is at least for now, this is what I can see myself doing. And if that yeah. changes, that's fine. Yeah. Great. What's, the, yes. what's your favorite part of, of being uh, behind the scenes? You know, uh, not necessarily on the stage, but it, uh, helping what is on the stage reach the audience. What's your favorite part of that? I think, I, I think part of it's just that sense of camar uh, camaraderie again of just working with this crew and being part of a team to achieve that. But uh, a lot of it is uh, there's something to be said about the un unsung hero in a way. 
and I, I definitely feel a, a bit more pride in sort of putting in work that might even not get recognized. You know, half the people don't even know that we're there nine hours in advance loading in gear or something. And I think... And a lot of people don't know that there is a sound person. Yeah. You know, I mean, really, when you think about it, the, the audience is kind of oblivious in that, in that yeah, instance. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is also just, I'm admittedly a really nervous person too, and I, I definitely cannot do anything on stage. <laughs> so it's sort of the closest I can be to, to this lifestyle mm -hmm. of traveling and, and being involved in stuff. Right, right. Great. Sorry, was there a question over here that we skipped? Yes. Oh. 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 This hurts. Be brave. All right, I'll be brave. Um, <laughs> it was also very early on too, which is just not a good sign. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, during our first show in Australia, we made a couple of what, changes. What artist is this? This is with Porter Robertson? With okay. Porter. Yep. Um, I made a couple of changes and forgot to uh, save them and ended up making it so that Porter ended up playing the wrong uh, sounds out of his keyboard during some of the songs. And I remember Porter just effectively saying that was the worst show in history. And that really was a big punch in the face. And that, you know, I mean, to be honest, we took it in stride and we sat in the green room after and just fixed it. We figured out what went wrong and, you know, I realized that, oh, I messed this up, um, you know, sorry, but it's the important thing is it's not going to happen again. You know, we can be progressive about it. You know, there are always shows, but I remember being in the, the golf cart on the Stereosonic compound going back and our, my lighting guy was sitting next to me and I was freaking out because... Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, half of me was like, oh, I'm going to get fired. I'm going to get sent home. Like, mm -hmm. I just ruined the, everything for, you know, 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. It was awful. So you were remaining calm then? Yeah. Yes. I was, I was very, I was, yeah. I was very collected on the back yeah, of this yeah. golf cart. Yeah. Um, and I remember that my, our lighting guy just, you know, I went to him and said, well, you're only good, at, you're only as good as your last show, which means I suck. And... <laughs> Um, the, I've, I'm sure some of you heard that expression before, and what what he told me kind of restored my faith in myself <laughs> and my job, and basically said that I don't think that's true. I, I think that you're as good as an average of your last ten shows, and if you work harder on the next shows, yeah. you know, will people will understand that you're yeah. really motivated? And I think that almost is more impactful than never messing up. Right. Right. Yeah, it's not actually true. You're only as good as your last show. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, no, that's that's great. I mean, you know, and that's and that's great testament to to remaining sort of to remaining um, you know resilient and constant and sort of being able to step back when you have a, a an emergency like that. You know, something really acute that happens mm -hmm. is really important. So you know, you step back and you you don't react so much and you sort of it's like being an athlete. You know, you have to shake it off and play the rest of the game. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, you know, at a point where you're, you know, if something happens, you'd have to find a contingency. And, yep. you know, if it was your fault, whatever, we can deal with it later. But yep. m mistakes happen, and right. as long as there's a solution to the problem, and it's right. okay. Right, right. Well, uh, I think, uh, you know, please join me in thanking Racy for being here. This is, this is great.